let's have a word of prayer. We'll get into God's word. Thank you, Father, so much for your goodness to us and for another week you blessed us with. And as we spend this time now, Lord, um, in worshiping you from, the, from your word, uh, I just pray that you'll give us guidance and understanding and that we will be drawn closer to you. And in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, that was a lot of fun. I got to say, I really I'm gonna get rid of this. Enjoyed that a lot. And um, so today's message, by the way, you know, this weekend is like what, like the, the, the pagan name actually is Easter weekend. You know, we we'll call it resurrection. You know, the re- this is the time that, of the season of the year, actually, the spring of the time when Jesus was crucified. And then he laid in the tomb on Sabbath. And then he rose early the first day, according to the scriptures. Uh, <clears throat> but I know everyone likes to focus on that. And as rightfully so, we should focus on that quite often and what's been done for us. But I'm going to... In this message, some of you maybe heard this before, but there'll be a little bit different things in it. Um, take a little bit of a different angle at that, and just uh, the appreciation of what Christ has done for us and uh, continues to do. So in the message today, we're going to have a little bit of the terms that everybody likes to use, justification and sanctification and righteousness by faith, all in one sermon. Like you heard those terms thrown around a lot, haven't you? And trying to define those, everybody likes to debate and argue about. Um, before we get into the thrust of the message, though, I'm going to turn my Bible real quick to Matthew chapter 13. If you remember in Matthew 13, Jesus had, um, had told several parables. The parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, I think he finishes, if I'm not mistaken, with the parable of the um, um, pearl, a great price. And he, he'd, he'd given these parables and given explana- explanations of them. And afterward, he asks his disciples something. He says to them... I don't know why I'm having such a tough time getting there. In Matthew 13, verse 51, it says, Jesus said unto them, have you, understand all, have you understood all these things? Did you get it? Right? Jesus is the one speaking, and he gave an explanation. Of course, I would think they would understand, right? You ever have sometimes when, when I preach, you, don't, you just like didn't get it? Like what was the point of that? Well, apparently Jesus had that issue sometimes as well, right? With people just not understanding what he was saying. But they said unto him, yeah, we get it. We understand. And I love his response next. He says, Then he said unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which when he brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. So it's kind of interesting what he's saying there, right? Basically, a good speaker, a good presenter, a good preacher, the scribes at the time not only were the ones that were scribing the Bible, they were the ones, they were the ones uh, that were supposed to explain what the Scriptures meant as well to people, right? And he says, so every good scribe is someone that can take something and bring it out of his treasure house, both things new and old. You ever heard someone say, oh, we're just, we're just New Testament Christians. We don't bother that Old Testament, right? You've heard him say that? Or <laughs> what's interesting here, Jesus says you'll bring both new and old and you'll put it together because they're not contradicting. So I'm going to try to be a good scribe today the best I can. We're going to bring things out of both new and old. And by the way, I thought it was interesting, last Sabbath, if you were here, the speaker that was speaking for us, Dr. Allison, do you remember what text he started in in the Bible? Haggai, right? And verse in Haggai. We're going to have a text from that, verse, that, chapter, from that book again today. So that'll be probably the only two, two times all year you'll hear um, verses come out of the book of Haggai. And, but that'll be today and last week. But we're going to begin in the old. So go with me to the book of Leviticus. As we contemplate the cross today, we go to the book of Leviticus. That makes sense. Leviticus chapter 6 is where we're going to. By the way, you do realize that all the Old Testament was all about Jesus. The sacrifices, the sanctuary, for those who have been coming to like the Bible studies we have on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary every Wednesday... Those that have been coming to that, you know, we learn, we learn from time to time quite a bit about the sanctuary service and what it was all about, right? The, the lamb represented Christ, right? The, uh, the lampstand was all about Christ. He was the light of the world. They filled with the oil, right? So it's all about Jesus, and this is no different here. And I'm going to read something about it that's going to fit in with the rest of the message, okay? So Leviticus 6 and verse 25, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of a sin offering. In... The place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. So it is most holy. What is most holy? The offering, the sin offering. And so why would the Bible call the sin offering most holy? It represented 
Jesus. So the, the offerings, the sin offerings and sacrifices were to, were to represent Jesus. And another thing that I thought was interesting that, that we point out from time to time is the fact that every time that God would have them bring a sin offering, he would tell them, he's not mentioning it here, but in the times when he's telling them, I want you to bring a sin offering in Leviticus, he says, and make sure it's without blemish. Always thought that was interesting. Like, you're bringing it to God. It, shouldn't, it should be without saying that, it has to be un, that you should bring the best or the most, the most perfect. But isn't it interesting that God has to remind us every time, I want you to bring your best to me. <laughs> what are we thinking? If you don't bring your best to God, <laughs> there's some serious spiritual impl implications with that, right? But he'd have to tell them. And I'm, sometimes I wonder if he would have to tell us today too. Let's move on. The priest that offers it for sin shall eat it. In the holy place it shall be eaten, in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. And whatsoever touches the flesh thereof shall be holy. Now that's an interesting statement. So once the animal was sacrificed, once it was killed as a sacrificial offering, anything that touched it became itself holy. Does anybody remember this message? A couple hands? Yeah, one or two? Good. Most of you aren't remembering it. That's okay. <clears throat> So this offering that was sacrificed was then holy, and anything that touched it itself became holy. And the offering represented who? Jesus. So anytime you come in contact with Christ, or anytime you come in contact with the offering according to the Scripture, you would then be made holy. Now, the rest of it goes on and says, When there is sprinkled of the blood thereof any garments, thou shalt wash thereof. It has been sprinkled in the holy place. Let's move on now to the book of Haggai. I don't know that I'm saying it correctly. I've never heard anybody say it the same way. I don't even say it the same way from one time to another. Go to the book of Matthew and back up two books, and you'll be there. Okay? Go to Matthew and back up two books. The book of Haggai, after the book of Zephaniah, the little prophet here. And we're going to start in chapter 2 and verse, read verse 11. And there's a little bit of quizzing going on here with this as well, but um, I'm thinking you guys will be quick studies and get this. All right, Haggai chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bears holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt he touches bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? So the, here's the question with the priest. You don't have to read the rest of it right yet. Look up. Hold on, don't read the rest of it yet. I want to see if you can get the answers. All right, so the question is this. If the priest pulls out the skirt of his garment, right, and he's carrying holy flesh, the animal's been sacrificed in his garment, right? And he goes on and says, but if the priest then touches the podium, does the podium, quit looking, David, does the podium become holy? Huh? Wait a minute. Now, the priest is holy, right? If the priest is touching the holy flesh, is he holy? Is the priest holy if he's touching the holy flesh? Yes, of course he is, right? Because he's carrying the flesh in his garment, right? So now that the priest is holy, if he touches the podium, does the podium become holy? No, the, you're right. The answer is no. So, are remembering this. Do you remember Do you remember that, or did you just read it? You just read it. Okay, good. All right, so look what it goes on and says. I asked you not to, but that's okay. And the priest answered and said no. So what, in other words, it's good, it's an interesting thought here. If you're touching the holy flesh, do you become holy? Yes, but if you make touch anything else, can you make it holy? No, by the way, it's a great gospel presentation there. I mean, think about it. In the idea of the gospel, if you come in contact with Christ and you're, and you're just right with him, and, and are you holy? Yes, you're holy. You can, actually can be holy as you come in contact with Christ. But can I go make somebody else holy now that I'm holy? No. You know what? I can say, okay, you know, here, here's this individual who um, I'm going to make this person, they, well, they want to follow Jesus. They want to be as holy as I am, right? And so I'm going to make this person holy. So I'm going I'm to make them start dressing the right way, you know, take off all the jewels, put on all the right clothes, go to, don't go to the wrong place, don't go to the right place, you know, go to the right place, don't go to the wrong place, eat the right food, don't eat the wrong food. And now I've got this person all cleaned up because they're like me. Are they now holy? No. What's the only way I can make them holy? is to let them be in contact with the Holy Flesh. Isn't that a beautiful presentation right there from the Old Testament? Right? So that's what it's saying. Being in contact with the Holy Flesh makes you holy, but in order to make someone else holy, you can't do it because it actually says, shall, shall, if this priest now touches any of these things, will they become holy? The answer was no. But now look at the next verse. Let's you just know how decrepit and sick we all are. Then said Haggai, if one that is unclean, by a dead body shall touch any of these, shall it be unclean. Now, don't read on. Please stop reading. 
All right, now the priest isn't holding holy flesh and being holy. Now the priest has been defiled and he's defiled. Now, if I'm the priest and I'm, on, I'm defiled and I touch the podium, do I defile the podium? Yes, you read ahead, didn't you? Right? Yes. So no matter how holy I am, I can't make something holy. But the scripture says if I'm defiled, I can mess things up. Man, that's pretty bad, isn't it? I mean, just think about how useless we are. As people, just think about it. We are useless. I mean, like, we, we can't make anything holy, and all we can do is mess things up. That's what the Bible says. That's what it goes on and says. And the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. So the only hope that any of us ever have of becoming holy or making someone else holy is to bring them in contact with the holy flesh, that holy being, if you will, right? So now with that background set, do you like the background? That's pretty good. We could stop there and be a good message, wouldn't it? I mean, from God, right? But there's more to it. Let's go back now to Leviticus chapter 5. Okay, we were in Leviticus 6. Now we're backing up to Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus, the fifth chapter. We're going to start reading in verse, um, we'll just start reading in verse 2. Uh, let's start verse 1. If a soul sins and hears the voice of swearing and is a witness, whether he has... Uh, seen it or known of it, if he does, does not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Verse 2, if a soul touches any unclean thing, a soul, by the way, so everybody knows on the same page, a soul is a human being, right? Body plus breath equals living soul, living being. So it's talking about people, right? So if someone touches any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of unclean cattle or the carcass of unclean creepy things, and if it's hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Now, it's interesting there. Even though he's unclean and guilty, does he have to do anything about it? No. Why? Because it says it's hidden from him. He doesn't know. Just keep that in the back burner of your mind for right now. If it comes to your knowledge, you have to do something about it. So you can be unclean and not know it. Everybody understand that? Can you be unclean and not know it? According to Levitical law, you sure could, right? Keep that in mind. Now, if he touches the uncleanness of a man, whatsoever uncleanness it be of a man shall be defiled withal, and it be hidden from him. When he knows of it, then he shall be guilty. So once you know, now you're guilty, right? Now keep in mind, the Old Testament sanctuary service, all of it was teaching us just about how nasty and messy and terrible sin is, right? And the only solution would be Jesus, that holy flesh that would come, right? That's what it was teaching in general. So it, had, it was a messy system, right? And we're going to read some more about this as we move through, especially for you women. You had all kinds of problems, right? But in general, the whole system, the way it was set up, was just to illustrate how bad sin is, right? If we were still following that system, we would all be like, man, because <laughs> it's such work and such problems and everything, right? And, but it was God illustrating just how messy it was. Now look at verse 4. Or if a soul swears, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, if it's hidden from him, when he knows of it, he shall be guilty of one of these, when he knows. And it shall be, when he shall be guilty of one of these things, he shall confess that he has, what's the word? Sinned in this thing. So to become unclean is, is equal, according to the scriptures, to sin. If you're unclean, you are guilty of sin. Everybody grasp that? Let me ask you a question before we get going too much further. The Messiah who is going to come in the future from Leviticus chapter 5, could he ever become unclean and still be the Messiah? No, because if you're unclean, you're also what? Guilty of sin, right? And so do you think that everyone that grew up in this Levitical system understood that? I'm going to say yes, unless there was some kind of mental problem. Everyone, that's the way they lived their life. You understand that, that, uh, that um, um uncleanness was equal to guilt, to sin. You had to go offer a sacrifice. You had to go through a process of being made clean again. Everybody grasp that? All right, now it goes on. It says, verse 6, He shall bring the trespass offering unto the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned. And then it goes on talking about the sacrifice that was to be brought for the sin of being coming unclean or guilty. Right? So if you become unclean, you are guilty. It was sin. Messiah couldn't be unclean and still be the Messiah. Let's go now to Leviticus chapter 15. So we're still in Leviticus. Move over just a few pages. Leviticus, the 15th chapter. And we're going to look at verse, just one verse here, 19. Notice what it says. If a woman has an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart for seven days. 
and whosoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Now, if you read all around that, above and below, and what's going on, bottom line was, if a woman has her issue, right, and someone touches her, that person themselves also became unclean, right, and guilty, and they would be unclean until evening, providing they went through the process of cleansing, right? It wasn't just, oh, you were automatically unclean until evening. You had to, like, offer the sacrifice, sprinkle the blood, do the washing, whatever you needed to do, different rules for different scenarios, but basically you had to go through a process in order to be made clean again. Is that making sense? Uncleanliness was equal to sin or guilt, right? Now let's go to Numbers chapter 19, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. But it had said there in verse 19, um, whosoever touches her becomes unclean, right? Whoever touches her becomes unclean. Now we're going to Numbers chapter 19. Let me get there myself. And we're going to look at verse 22. Leviticus, Numbers 19. And 22, the Bible says, Whatsoever an unclean person touches shall be unclean, and the soul that touches it shall be unclean until evening, providing they go through the cleansing process described just above there, right? So if you touch someone unclean or if someone unclean touched you, either way you became what? Guilty, unclean. Right? You are guilty and unclean and would have to offer a sacrifice and we'll be made clean again. I'm going to ask you one more time before we turn to the New Testament text. Is it possible ever for the Messiah to come yet in the future from the book of Numbers here, it would it be possible for him to ever be unclean and still be the Messiah? Everybody's in agreement? Let's go on then to the book of Mark, chapter 5. Mark, chapter 5. I'm going to show you from Mark chapter 5, something interesting about Jesus. Now, to back up just a little bit, we're going to start in verse 24 when we start the reading, but let me give you the background. Jesus is going around doing all kinds of great things, healing all kinds of people, doing wonderful things. Um, then this man, uh, Jer- Jerias, uh, who was the, one of the chief rulers in the synagogue, had a daughter that was dying, and he comes to Jesus and says, please come and save my daughter. Jesus says, okay, I'll go. Now he's on his way, and the Bible says this in verse 24. And Jesus went with him, and many people followed him and thronged him. I like how that's worded, right? You heard that, we sing that song about, I want to be like Jesus in the home or in the throng, right? So what's thronging mean? Like, it's a crowd of people, and they're all around him. They're all touching Jesus. They're all wanting to be close to Jesus. This great teacher, this great preacher, everybody's following around. So they're all thronging him. And it says, and a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. Now, let me ask you real quick, if a woman has an issue, what did the Bible say about her? She was unclean. Anyone that touches her or anyone that she touches becomes unclean and guilty. Right? Let's move on. She had suffered many things of many physicians. (laughs) I love how that's worded too. That is so good. Right? How many of you have suffered many things of many physicians? Like every time I go to the doctor, no matter what's wrong, right? Right? (laughs) <laughs> they want to stick you with needles or something. You know, I broke my arm. Let me put a needle in you. What's that have to do with anything, right? Always wanting to make you painful, right? That's way back then. This woman had suffered many things and many physicians. Some things haven't changed in 2,000 years of time and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. Don't miss this point. The Bible don't just, God don't just write these things in there for, for uh, just for reading or, or just for, so you have something to look at every once in a while and, and, and pretend that I've, like I've had a devotional because I read some words. He put it there because he wants us to think about what's happening as well, right? Think about how God operates. Think about his, how he relates to us, his connection to us. Notice here that this woman had done everything that she could to make herself right right? She, she'd been to every physician. She spent all of her money. But no matter how hard she tried to make herself good, she only got worse. Anybody ever had that situation in your life? And no matter how hard you try to be good, every time the temptation come, you fail, right? Now, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to be good. I'm going to make everything right. And you messed up again, right? Ugh, I'm so guilty. Will I ever be able to do anything? I'm never going to be able to go to heaven because I'm so bad. I'm just bad, and there's nothing I can do to make myself good. Have you ever felt like that? <laughs> yeah. If you, don't say, if you don't say that, you're probably lying because every one of us at some point, that's what finally led us to Jesus is the fact that we couldn't make ourselves better. And then it goes on. She didn't get any better but rather got worse. But verse 27, 
when she had, what's it say? Heard of Jesus. Notice it doesn't say that she had some kind of great evidence where she had seen Jesus, you know, do some kind of great miracle, raise a dead person or heal a sick person. It just says she had heard of him, which is really wonderful because that's all you and I can do. We can only hear of him, right? And his greatness and his goodness until she heard of Jesus. And then it says this. She came behind in the press and touched his garment. Now, you just read from the Bible that Jesus is not the Messiah. Here we are, Easter weekend, right? You just read from the Bible that Jesus is not the Messiah. How do you read that? If someone is touched by a woman that is unclean with an issue, that person himself becomes what? Unclean and therefore guilty and therefore could not possibly be the Messiah. Now, I want you to think some things through. We're going to get to the right answer. Please, I don't pray that I don't drop dead and none of you leave before I get to finish this. But what I want you to understand is what's happening here. The, that first of all, the faith that this woman has and the chance she's taking. Let me tell you what she deserves at this point. For this woman who is filthy, rotten, unclean, who, who everybody in town no doubt knows, they have to know her. I mean, do you think if there was someone in this church that had some kind of debilitating disease that they've been to every doctor in town, spent all their money, and basically the church is trying to support her because she can't support herself because she's spending all of her money on her, on her doctor bills and things, do you think there would be anybody that would not know this, right? I have no doubt the woman's not mentioned by name here, right? But we're just going to believe here that everybody knew who this woman was. Don't have to mention her by name. She's unclean. She sneaks up through the crowd, and I can picture the crowd, by the way. They were thronging Jesus. So how did she get to Jesus without touching somebody? <laughs> like, a, it's the Red Sea, right? This woman's coming up through there, and she's moving through, and the people just start parting, parting, and parting. And it, by the way, in Luke's version, Luke, uh, Luke 8, 44, his version, the same story, it says that she touched the hem of his garment. Now, if she touches the hem of his garment, what kind of position is she in? She's on the ground. Like, she's, she's getting up through the crowd there, and it's like, like this, like this, and like this, and she's, like, on the ground grabbing the hem of his garment, the Bible says. Right? So everybody parts. She touched the hem of his garment, which would make Jesus unclean, which would make him not the Messiah. But remember what we read in the Old Testament? The holy flesh. Whatever comes in contact with the holy flesh itself becomes clean, holy. Isn't this good? So look what it goes on and says. Look how it f finishes here. She come behind and she touched his garment. Verse 28. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I will be made whole. If she's not made whole, if she touches his garment and nothing happens, you know she could be facing a stoning? At very least, she could be facing a terrible, I don't know how you're going to translate this, tongue thrashing. Right? In other words, she's going to be yelled at. She's going to be, people are going to be mad at her. Here we got this young rabbi. Some people think he's even the Messiah. And you have just defiled him, made him unclean. Right? But instead, she sneaks up behind him. She touches his garment. And it says in verse 29, and I love how it's worded in the King James, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. What does straightway mean? immediately. Notice it doesn't say that she came up behind him, touched his garment, and after about six more months of therapy, she was healed. Right? They'd done some more work with her and a and, and, and few more things, and after a few more doctor visits, she got better. No. It says immediately she was made whole. And why is that? Because this woman had just come in contact with that holy flesh, who was Jesus. Now, it's interesting as it goes on because it says, and she felt in her body she was healed of this plague. Did she know she was healed? Yes. And Jesus immediately, knowing that virtue had gone out from him, and I love the word virtue there. The word in the Greek is dunamis, where we get a word dynamite from. It means power, right? Power had gone out from him, turned about in the press and said, who touched me? Actually, who touched my clothes? <laughs> the disciples said unto him, everybody They said, you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? And it's like, almost like an embarrassing for the disciples. Jesus says, who touched me? Now imagine it, if you're walking out and you see somebody, and everybody's grabbing this person, touching this person, wanting to be next to him, and he says, who touched me? Like everybody stands back, right? Because the guy's kind of losing it or something. Right? Who touched you? But he knew it was different. You know what's powerful by this? Did Jesus know the lady was healed? 
the lady know the lady was healed? Why does he have to stop and make a scene? Why does he have to stop and make a scene for this, right? And it's very interesting. We'll, we'll think about it through. I think there's more than one reason as to why. Picture this, if you will. Who was always following Jesus around to catch him up? Scribes and Pharisees. Like, they, they wanted to nail him, right? And so they are no doubt there, and they're probably some of the ones that stepped aside as Messy Mary come walking through the crowd, right? And she's moving up there, getting up there to, to his garment, and everybody gets out of the way for her you know, as she's moving up, and she gets up there and touches his garment, and they're like, oh, he's unclean. But no one says anything. Jesus goes on to Jairus' house. About the time he gets there, somebody says, oh, wait a minute, everybody, hold on a minute. Jesus, um, you need to go to the temple because you're unclean. See, we just saw her come through and touch your garments. And therefore, you're unclean and guilty. You're not the Messiah. You need to go make things right. <laughs> so Jesus stops. Who touched me? And you can imagine, what, what kind of position is she in? She's laying on the ground, like right down there behind her. Probably curled up a little bit like, I'm healed, right? And he says, who touched me? And now she's afraid. Would you be afraid? And so she's trembling, she's trembling, and she says, uh, it was me. Let, me. let me read it to you. The disciples said unto him, you see everybody touching you. He looked round about and saw her that had done this thing, and the woman was fearing and trembling. She was terrified. Knowing what was done in her, she came down and fell before him and told him all the truth. So she tells the story about how she was filthy, how she had tried. It says she told him all the truth. I tried everything to make myself better. I couldn't make myself any better no matter how hard I tried. But I come and I touched him, and now I am made whole. Ooh, doesn't that give you goosebumps? Nothing she could do to make herself better but come to Jesus, and immediately she was made whole, so she tells, tells all the truth. No one can accuse Jesus of being unclean. Incidentally, whenever she came and touched his garment, are you aware that Jesus had no choice but to make her clean? Not because of her faith necessarily, not because of anything that she had in her, any virtue she had in her, that she deserved anything, right? Not because any of that, but because of who he is. Our scripture reading that was quoted here this morning so well, notice she didn't read it, right? I know it's an easy one, but still it's a verse that's in her mind. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, right? So the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me ask you the question. When you go to Jesus and ask him to cleanse you of your sins, does he have any choice but to do it? Now, that sounds blasphemous. She said, no. He has no choice? Well, isn't that maybe somewhat presumptuous? No, it's not, because that's what the Bible says. Let me ask you this question. Can God lie? No, how do you know God can't lie? Because the Bible says in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, God who cannot lie, promise these things, since, right? So God cannot lie according to the Scripture. So we can say, God, you can't lie. I'm not being presumptuous. I'm just saying that's what he says. And my friends, listen, whenever he says... That if you come to him, he'll make you clean. When he promises, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us, which I think is very interesting, from all unrighteousness, can he, does he have any choice but to do it? No, because of who he is. That's just how he is, right? By the way, if the woman would have touched Jesus' clothes and not been made clean, would Jesus have been the Messiah? No, he couldn't have been. He would have been guilty, right? So let me ask you this question. If you come in all of your filth, which you have, and you reach out to Christ and ask him to forgive you your sins, if he doesn't do it, can he still be the Messiah? No. That's like saying, it's, it's like saying, I reached out and I touched him, but he didn't heal me. You know, you've had these people, and I have them on a, a regularly or somewhat. They're, they're, we almost hold them up as almost like pious people, but really you're blasphemous. The ones that says, oh, but you don't know how bad I've been. You know, I've been so bad and rotten, I just can't believe that Jesus can actually forgive me. I've asked him for forgiveness, but I just, I just can't see how he can forgive me. I've been so bad, and I've messed up again, and, and, I, and, I've, and I, I don't know that I, if I ask him, I don't think he can forgive me. You ever heard somebody talk like that? And then we're like, oh, that person, they're so, they're so like, almost like pious because they recognize just how bad their sin is and how holy God is. And No, you're blaspheming. <laughs> right? If, in other words, if you don't believe, but when you ask him that he's healed you, you're believing that you're a greater sinner than he is a savior. You're, not, you're actually denying his messiahship, right? If the woman touches Jesus and is not made clean, he's not the messiah. If you reach out to Jesus by faith and you say, Lord, heal me of my sins, and he doesn't do it, he's not the messiah. You're denying his messiahship. 
You're denying him as a savior. You know, a lot of people, they love to make Jesus a savior of the world, but to make him my savior is a little harder. Because you don't know how bad I've been. Well, you don't know how bad this woman was. But yet she touches Jesus and she's made clean. As a matter of fact, it's impossible for any other thing to happen. The Bible says whoever comes in contact with that holy flesh themselves to become clean, holy, just. Good news for all of you sinners. All of us sinners. Now she was healed, but I'm going to change the story a little bit because I think this fits us well. You mind if I change the Bible story? Okay, I'm going to change it. Let's say that the woman didn't sneak up behind Jesus and touch his garment. Let's say for a moment that the woman come in front of Jesus and says, Jesus, will you heal me? And he says, sure, I'll heal you. Here's what I need you to do first, though. First, I need you to live for one month the way I tell you to. I want you to quit eating this food. I want you to quit wearing these clothes and start wearing these clothes. Cover that up. I want you to quit going to these places and start going to these places. You do that for one month, and I'll heal you. Now, you think this question through before you answer it too quickly, because a lot of times people answer it too fast. Do you think the woman would have done everything Jesus asked her to for that month? Let me ask it another way. Would you have? Oh, yeah, how perfectly would you have done it? <laughs> I would have made no mistakes, you know what I mean? Like every day, you've spent all of your money, you've done everything you could to try to get rid of this filthiness, right? And he says, if you'll just do this for one month, I'll cleanse you, right? I'll make everything right. You would do it for the month, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Now here, this is the, by the way, sh- justification was her getting what she didn't deserve. When she was healed, she didn't deserve it. She was justified, right? She, it, but he made her right. Now we're changing the story. She comes up to Jesus and says, look, I want to be healed. And he says, I will, but you do this for a month. She does it perfectly for a month. Now she comes back at the end of the month. She comes up to Jesus and she says, Jesus, I did it. Heal me. So now he heals her. What do you think her attitude would have been toward Jesus from then on? All right, see, I got what I deserved, right? I did what he told me to do. I've got it. I'm out of here. But what do you think the attitude of this woman is in the story after she's been healed? What did she deserve? A beating. What did she get? A healing. What do you think she would do if Jesus asked her, after he healed her here on the first story, after he healed her, what do you think she would do if he says, I want you to live like this for the rest of your life? I want you to eat this way for the rest of your life. I want you to quit wearing these things and start wearing these things for the rest of your life. What do you think your attitude would have been toward him in that that idea? Yeah, what would your attitude be? Yeah, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask me forever. Like, I can do nothing. You heal me, whatever you want. You know, it's interesting. I think a lot of folks, a lot of us, never really come to an understanding and appreciation for what Christ has really done for us because we're, we're kind of stuck on the rearranged story in the Bible. I'm going to make everything right so that God will forgive me, and then I get to go. And somehow, somehow we have in our mind that if I just do things a certain way, and do a certain, do, do, if I can do things right enough, that God will accept me and I can go. And what we need to realize is it's how rotten you are. God can accept you because you are filthy, you are unclean. Anything you touch defiles anything else you touch. And we've all touched each other. We're all a mess, to say it lightly. But Christ comes... We ask him, Lord, please save me because I'm doomed to be lost for eternity. I'm terrible. I'm filthy. I can't go to heaven like this. There's no way. I'm going to be lost. And Lord, please save me. And he does. You're justified. But then you say, Lord, I'm still going to live the way I want to live because after all, I kind of deserve this. (laughs) No. I almost really wish. I really wish. I've said this before. I wish that every time we sinned, a great big bump popped up on our forehead. And everybody else would look at you and like, ooh, that's disgusting. And we're like, I can't fix it. And the Lord says, I'll fix it. And he heals it. We would all be like, oh, thank you, Lord. Sin's a lot worse than that big bump. Right? And now the po- reason I'm making this point is, uh, is, is like you can't miss this in the, in the, in the story here, in the, in the actual story that happened. This woman would do whatever Jesus asked her to do from now on without complaining, without saying, it's my body, I'll do what I want. It's my life, I'll live how I want. I'll watch what I want. I'll eat what I want. I'll do what I want. Leave me alone. No one would say that if you were the woman with the issue. And we are the woman with the issue. We are unclean. And Jesus, if we come to him, will heal us and make things right. 
So she asked to be healed, and she was. Is that all making sense? By the way, righteousness by faith is the woman that was justified for touching him, and then whatever he wanted from her for the rest of her life, she's willing to do it because of what he's done for her already. The mixed up, non-Christian version of that is the one that comes to Jesus and says, I'll do what you want me to do if you'll just heal me. And that's why I had to mix up the story a little bit. But let's go on from there. Y'all grasp that pretty good, right? Let's make it a little deeper. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 19 for a moment. Numbers chapter 19. Because we got the terrible rotten people out of the way. Now we got to hit on the good people. Numbers chapter 19, starting in verse 11. He that touches the dead body of a man shall be unclean for seven days. Touch the dead body of a man, you're unclean for how long? Seven days. He shall purify himself with it on the third day, and on the seventh day he shall be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day, then on the seventh day he shall not be clean. Whosoever touches the dead body of any man that is dead, and I always get a tickle every time I read that, the dead body of any man that is dead. How can you touch the dead body of a man that's not dead? And then it says, and does not purify himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. And that soul, the individual, shall be cut off from the church. Israel, that's what it says. Right? So if you become unclean and you don't go through the cleansing process, you're to even be cut off, which I think is very interesting. Type in the Old Testament, anti-type New Testament, you know, like meeting met in the gospel. If you don't go to Christ for cleansing, you shouldn't even be part of the church. If you don't go get cleansed, just cut them off. Interesting, huh? <laughs> because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him, he shall be unclean as uncleanness is yet upon him. Verse 14, this is the law. When a man dies in a tent, all that come into the tent and all that are in the tent shall be unclean for seven days. Uh, every open vessel which has no covering bound upon it is unclean. And whosoever touches, now listen to this, whosoever touches one that is slain with a sword or in the open fields or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean for seven days. And it goes through the whole process of cleansing. <coughs> now my time is running okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read that process of cleansing. Listen to this. And for an unclean person, they shall take the ashes of a burnt heifer for purification for sin and running water and shall be put there in a vessel. And a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it upon the tent and upon the vessels and upon the persons that were there and upon him that touched a bone or one slain or dead body or a grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day. And on the seventh day, he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be clean at evening. Aren't you thankful but what was it teaching them? The messiness of sin. <clears throat> now, <coughs> everyone understands that all these folks understood it by the time of Jesus. They were understanding this whole process pretty well. For thousands of years, they've been practicing this, right? For a thousand years anyway, they've been practicing this. So now let's move. Let's move back to the New Testament. So if someone touches a dead person or a bone or a grave, they become unclean. Unclean is also what? Guilt. And if you're guilty, you've done what? Sin. And if you sin, you can't be the... Messiah, very, very good, right? So now let's move to the New Testament and find out how this works. Let's go to Luke chapter 5. Luke, the fifth chapter. Luke chapter 5. Now, <clears throat> some thinks they know where we're going with this, but you might be surprised. Luke chapter 5, verse 15. But so much more went out the, the fame of Jesus, and great multitudes came together to hear him, and he healed, uh, and to be healed by the, uh, from their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness, and he prayed. Now, verse 17. It came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by. Who was sitting by? Pharisees and doctors of the law. You think these people were being considered clean or unclean? Not how you look at them now, as you read the Bible, but biblically, and according to all the people around, were these guys good guys or bad guys? No, they're very good guys, very clean. They kept the law perfectly. It goes on to say, they were all sitting around, which were out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, in context of the verse, who's the them that the power of the Lord was there to heal? The scribes and Pharisees, right? Yeah, so the power of the Lord was there to heal them, but what did they need to be healed from? These guys had it all together. They were clean, or were they? Go with me, to, and I love this verse. This is one of those verses in Luke chapter 11 where you may have wondered at some point, what in the world does this verse mean? Luke 11, this is for all of you good people out there, right? The ones that got it all together. 
you all need to hear this. Notice what Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes, Luke eleven forty four. 44. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. In other words, you actors. For ye are like grays which do not appear, and men walk over them and are not aware of them. <laughs> what in the world does that mean? You're like grades that don't appear. Men walk over them, not aware of them. Remember what we learned? That if you become unclean, you were still guilty. You just didn't have to do anything about it until you figured it out, right? Now, what is a grave that does not appear? That's a grave that's not marked by a tombstone, right? So there's a grave, and it's not marked by a tombstone. If I walk across a grave not marked by a tombstone, am I unclean and guilty? Yes, but do I have to do anything about it? No, unless it comes to my attention, right? I'm still unclean. I just can't do anything because it has not been brought to my attention. So he says, scribes and Pharisees, you're like unmarked graves. What's he saying? You guys are filthy, unclean, and everybody that comes in contact with you, you're making unclean. You can imagine what that sounded like to the, church, the, to the everyday, everyday church members' ears. They're like, he just called the conference president unclean. <laughs> I mean, he did, didn't he? Jesus just said, you guys are like graves that do not appear. Men are touching them and becoming defiled and unclean. Every day, people are coming in contact with you and becoming defiled because of your filthiness, because of your wickedness. Now, here's what's really neat about that. Jesus can cleanse, no matter how holy you are or how filthy you are, he can cleanse you up if you'll come to him. Like if the scribes and Pharisees, as bad as they were, as good as they were, they were still unclean, if they would have just come to Jesus, he would have healed them. The power of God was there to heal them. He wanted to save even those mean church leaders. Ah, that's, praise the Lord. This is what God's about, right? He wants to save everybody. And no matter how good you are, you need to be healed. Or no matter how bad you are, you need to be healed. And there's only one answer, and that's that holy flesh. That's Jesus, if we'll just come to him. Now, we read there that it's speaking about, and if you come in contact with a dead person or anything like that, that you become unclean, not the Messiah. Right? These Pharisees wouldn't come to Jesus to be cleansed. What a shame. I'd say that for all of us. And this, this particular weekend, particularly, we're looking at this, what Jesus has done for us. If we'll come to him, he will make you clean. And I, I can guarantee you when, you, when you grasp that, what Jesus has done for you, your life will be different. You won't be offended if he asks you not to do something, or if he asks you to do something, or if he asks you not to eat something. You won't be offended because we recognize that he's done for me. So now let's move on to another impossible story, Luke chapter 7. And by the way, if, if, if you read that through the Gospel of Luke, what's very interesting is Luke really focuses in on this a whole lot. All these healings, all these things, all of them's found in Luke's Gospel just about. Almost everything is there. What was Luke's occupation? He was a doctor. <laughs> he was really impressed, right? I've been practicing medicine all this time, and Jesus comes along and just speaks the word, and they're okay. Luke 7, verse 11 Another impossible situation. What's interesting as we go through these, these little storylines, and I don't want you missing this either for all of us, the first storyline, the woman come looking for Jesus, and he healed her. The second storyline, this guy's dead, he can't do anything, and Jesus comes and finds him. Listen to what it says. It came to pass, verse 11, of Luke 7, it came to pass after that that he went into the town of city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And the Lord had saw her and had compassion on her, and he said to her, weep not. I think it's so good. I mean, this story. This woman, her husband's dead. She has one son. The only thing between her and poverty is her son that can work and support her. That, they didn't have the... the ways of doing things we have today, right? It was, it was a very poor situation. If you were a woman, particularly, and you just become widowed, and now you had one son that was supporting you, he's dead, she was facing poverty and a terrible, distressful life, whatever life she had left. She was looking at gloom and doom, and she's weeping, and she's not even looking up, and she's praying, God, why couldn't you do something about this? And I believe Jesus comes along in answer to her prayer. And what's really interesting about it, it was her son. And I want to tell you this, for you, those that have children that are not following, that are spiritually dead, don't stop praying for them. God's paying attention. This is good. Jesus is paying attention. He comes and he says, weep not. Her son was dead. And he came and touched the casket. Jesus could not be the Messiah. 
when he touches the casket, not the Messiah. Why is that? Because the Bible says in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, definitely without a shadow of a doubt, if you come in contact with a grave, a casket, a bone, or a dead body, any of these things, you yourself become unclean and guilty and have to go through the sacrificial process. And so the only thing that can happen does happen. When that holy flesh touches a hopeless situation of someone dead and filthy and unclean, the only thing that can happen does happen. He doesn't become filthy. The dead become clean. And the only way a dead person becomes clean is to be made alive. I love this story. So look what happens. He touches the casket, and it says, And they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And I've heard it said, and I believe it to be so. Had he not called him out, young man, this particular individual, those that are around in that area that was dead, that was in the earshot of his voice, probably would have come out of their grave too. Young man, arise. And he that was dead set up and began to speak and delivered it to his mother. And I'll tell you, If you've ever been to the funeral of an untimely death, and what I mean by untimely is it's not right that the child dies before the parent. It's not right that a child or a grandchild dies before the parent or grandparents. It's just not right. It's an untimely death. It's just just not the way things are supposed to be, right? If you've ever been to one of those funerals, you know how sad and how tragic and how just sickening they are. And you can imagine what it would be like if you was in that situation and you saw something like that happen and that dead person rose up and got up. What do you think anybody and everybody would be doing? Oh, their whole lives would be changed, you know? And I think it's very interesting. Here's another great illustration to the story. Not only that woman and son, but everybody standing around, probably if Jesus would have said, hey, here's how I want you to live the rest of your lives, would have said, I would love to do that. Out of appreciation for what he did, right? Now, I'm going to read this to you out of Desire of Ages because it is said so much better here than I could ever say it. This was an impossible situation, and Jesus came and found them and fixed it. You know, he specializes in impossible situations. That's good news for all of you. (laughs) For me, right? Because I know some, you're impossible. But yet, we come in contact with Christ, and he makes the impossible possible. Listen to this. The Tsar of Ages, page 318. As they draw near, a funeral train is seen coming from the gates. With slow, sad steps, it's proceeding to the place of burial. On an open casket in front is the body of the dead, and about it are the mourners filling their air with wailing cries. You ever been to one of those funerals, hear that? The wailing cries? All the people of the town seem to be gathered to show their respect for the dead and their sympathy for bereaved. It was a sight to awaken sympathy. The deceased was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. The lonely mourner was following to the grave her sole earthly support and comfort. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and she, as she moved on blindly, weeping, not noting his presence. And he came close beside her and gently said, Woman, weep not. Jesus was about to change her grief into joy, yet he could not forbear this, ex- this expression of tender sympathy. And here, here's the best part. When I first studied this out and I, was, and I saw this going on, I thought I had something new. And then I found out I really didn't have anything new because she said this a long time before I ever discovered it. And it says, he came and touched the casket. To him, even contact with death could impart no defilement. Isn't that powerful? So Jesus could not be defiled. Why is that? He was the... Holy flesh. Isn't that powerful? Like, he, like, she picks this up long before I ever discovered it, right? That the very fact that when Jesus touches the casket, he'll be made unclean, he'll be made guilty, couldn't be the Messiah. But with Jesus, even contact with you can impart no defilement. The bearer stood still. The lamentations of the mourners ceased. Two companies gathered about the casket, hoping against hope. One was present who had banished the diseases, who had vanquished demons. Was death subject to his power? With clear, authoritative voice, the words are spoken. Young man! I say to you, arise. The voice pierces the ears of the dead. The young man opens his eyes. Jesus takes him by the hand, lifts him up, and his gaze falls upon her who had been weeping beside him, and mother and son unite in a long, clinging, joyous embrace. You cannot read that or hear that without thinking a little bit and getting somewhat chills. That's That's going to be done millions of times over at the second coming. Only it's not going to be this cheap thing. Yeah, the young man kind of got cheated if you think about it. He had to die again. You know, Hebrews 13, or 11, rather, talks about that. That though some people never received a resurrection, that they may receive a better one. Right? A better one, one that lasts forever. But he's resurrected, and, and this, this happens because of the power of Jesus. By the way, whenever Jesus comes in contact with this dead guy, the only thing that can happen does happen. Jesus can't become un- unclean, filthy. He is filthy, becomes clean by being raised from the dead. Those are all good stories. Does it bring you any hope and encouragement? Because we all need it, because we're all filthy. One more story, and I'll let you go. 
You know what's worse than death? Leprosy. See, death, you're kind of decaying and rotting away, and you really don't know it because the living know that they'll die, but the dead know nothing. But how would you, if you had the choice, if you had to make the choice here, okay, would you rather decay and not know it or decay and know it? Which would you rather do? <laughs> I'd rather be dead, right? Leprosy is like living and being dead at the same time. We're going to look at the story here. This was the worst of the worst. You remember they had leper colonies, right? If you had leprosy, they put all of you in one little town, and no one in that town wanted to hug you because of the way you looked with your leprosy, and no one, if you went out of town, would ever hug you because they, if you were unclean, you were filthy, and, and it, was, it was thought, you know, they'd become in contact, you could become unclean yourself. So a leper never embraced anybody. A leper never had, never had anybody come up and give them a handshake or a hug or, or even talk to them. If they come into anywhere near town, they would come through town saying, unclean, unclean, and everybody would run away and get away. Maybe we ought to start doing that. If you sin this week when you come to church next Sabbath, you come in saying, unclean, unclean, if you haven't asked forgiveness. <laughs> Leprosy, a type of sin. That's what they would have to do. Kind of embarrassing, wouldn't it be? And you're kind of, you know, what happens with them is they lose, like, in different, depends on what kind of leprosy you have. I've studied some things on this, right? But you would not have feeling in your hands, and you'd be cutting, the, cutting something, you just cut your finger right off, and you didn't even know it. Or you'd just make gashes, and you'd have, and it would get infected, and you would start rotting, and things would start falling off, and it just got worse all the time. It was terrible. Leprosy. By the way, leprosy is an impossible to be healed from. Even today, we can do something, but it's just like, Back then, no hope. If you were a leper, you were doomed. If you were a leper, what would you do to be healed? Anything you could. So let's get to the story. Back to Luke chapter 5 now. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 12. <clears throat> this is for all you lepers out there. And we all are lepers, according to the scriptures. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 12. Um, and it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy. Now, you could be a leper, but what did it mean if he was full of leprosy? You were terrible. You were rotten. So it, this is for all of you that are full of sin, full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. I can picture this, right? The disciples, what happens if a leper come by? What would everybody do? If a leper just walked right down that hall, right down the aisle here, what do you think you all would do? You're back in the days of Jesus, and a leper walks right down that aisle. He's not going to touch anybody. Just walking down the aisle, what would you all do? You would just like, right? <laughs> you spread out. And you can imagine, this leper comes running up to Jesus, and the disciples are like probably running behind Jesus, right? Getting back there. And he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, here's where it gets really interesting, because I want to read it to you in a moment. I'll just explain it to you first. When Jesus reached out to heal him, to, do, to, to touch him here, the disciples, it says, sought to prevent their master from touching him. I can picture that. You ever see those, you ever watch like television sometimes and put it in slow motion, right? And it's like right when it gets to the dramatic scene, it's like, no, and they're like diving to prevent something. I can picture this here with the disciples. It's like they see Jesus reaching toward the leper and Peter and the others are like, no, stop. Because if he touches the leper, himself becomes unclean. He's not the Messiah. The disciples thought they were falling around the Messiah. They're like, you don't get it, Jesus. Don't touch him. But what happens when that holy flesh comes in contact with even filthy leprosy? The only thing that can't happen does happen. Good news for you and me. Listen to how it goes on. Let's read it. So the man was full of leprosy. When he sees Jesus, he falls down and he sees him saying, If you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. That makes Jesus not the Messiah. Except when the holy flesh comes in contact with your filthiness, the only thing that can happen does happen. Jesus says, I will be thou clean. And immediately... The leprosy departed from him. I don't know how that must have looked. I mean, Hollywood graphics could no way do justice to what, that, what took place right there. I mean, the guy, if he was full of leprosy, was missing, was missing appendages, right? He was missing things. And when Jesus touched him, completely new again. Remember the story of the leper, Naaman, right? And he dipped seven times, and his, and his skin was like baby skin, right? Not only did he stopped the leprosy from being there, but he restored it like new. That's something for you to think about. Jesus doesn't just forgive your sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and make things like new. 
cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, are you aware that when you come to Jesus, he doesn't just forgive your sins, but if you come to him, he can make you better than new? He can make you where you don't do that anymore. Truly coming to him. So the leper comes to him and it says he was made all brand new again, like everything was fixed. Now I can't do it justice, so I'm going to read it again. Listen to this. The work of Christ in cleansing the leper from this terrible disease is an illustration of his work in cleansing the soul from sin. Isn't that beautiful? It's an illustration of him cleansing you from sin. The man who came to Jesus was full of leprosy. Its deadly poison had permeated his whole body. body. Listen to this. The disciples sought to prevent their master from touching him. <laughs> there goes, my, there goes my, my imagination, the slow motion thing, right? You can, you can picture them. It's like they don't want to get close to the leper. They don't want Jesus touching him, and they see him doing it, and they're like, no. All right. But laying, uh, touching him, for he who touched the leper himself became unclean. Unclean and not the Messiah, right? But in laying his hand upon the leper, Jesus receives no defilement. His touch imparts life-giving power. The leprosy is cleansed. Thus it is with the leprosy of sin. Deep-rooted, deadly, impossible to be cleansed by human power. It's what? Impossible to be cleansed by human power. I love that over and over. Every story we looked at, was it, it, was it possible for humans to do anything? No, and your sin, and no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you atone for it, no matter what, what you do, how you make things right, you are still guilty. Impossible to be cleansed by human power. Thus it is with the leprosy of sin, deep-rooted, deadly, impossible to be cleansed by human power. The whole head is sick, the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, Isaiah 1, 5, and 6. But Jesus, listen to this, Coming to dwell in humanity receives no pollution. <laughs> That's so good. See, this wasn't original. This was from, the, from reading this book, Desire of Ages, in case you want to read it yourself. His presence has healing virtue for the sinner. Listen to this. Whoever will fall at his feet, saying in faith, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. We'll hear the answer, I will be made thou clean. That's according to the scriptures. That's from Matthew 8, 2, and 3. If you'll come to him. My friends, you can't come to him in your goodness. You can't come to Jesus and say, I've got most of it together, Lord. If you can just fix this last part, I know I'll be all right. It, no matter if you're the, the, the righteous Pharisee or the filthy woman with the issue, no matter which side you're on, if you just come to him, he will make you clean. You can live differently, by the way, when that happens. When you have the assurance of knowing that Jesus has forgiven you and you have eternal life to look forward to, can't that not change your life? I think sometimes we get so mixed up. We're talking about one group has everybody wanting them to change their life. Another group just says, well, just, just admit you're a sinner because we're all sinners. and Just like, like you're going to continue to live that way. And both camps are kind of wrong. There's a, there's a middle ground that just says, look, I am filthy, but Jesus, if I come in contact with him, will make me holy. He'll make me right. He can fix me. You know, I, I can't end without going to this text in Isaiah 64, verse 6, to finish this up. Isaiah 64, 6, it does fit so perfectly. We, we would understand this verse a lot better if you understood more of the Old Testament, for sure. But in Isaiah 64, 6, it says, we are all as an unclean thing. So how many of us are as an unclean thing? All of us. And all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Do you ever think about that, what that's saying? All the good that we do, all of our righteousnesses, all the stuff that we do to make things right are as filthy rags. And my friends, I don't mean to be this way, but I got to tell you this way so you'll understand just how terrible this is. The Bible usage here of filthy rags is women's menstrual rags. That's the usage. You look it up. All of your goodness, as good as you are, no matter how holy you think you are, you're just like the woman that was... In the mess that touched Jesus' garment, you are filthy, unclean, not even worth touching. That's you and me. All of our righteousness is filthy rags. <laughs> That's pretty terrible, isn't it? You know what I like about that too, by the way, though? If your righteousness is filthy rags, what's your unrighteousness like? And Jesus says, 1 John 1, 9, to finish, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all of our righteousness. I know it says unrighteousness in the Bible, but do we need cleanse from our righteousness too as well? Yeah, your righteousness or your unrighteousness, my friends, all of it needs to come to Christ. 
his death, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, that whole thing is tied up. Our only hope is to come to him. And he will make you clean. Isn't that good news? All of us, no matter how bad we are, no matter how rotten we are, how far we've gone, if we'll come to him today, he'll make you clean. So how about it? There may be some here that think of themselves as quite righteous, quite holy. I invite you to come to Jesus today. There may be others who think that you've been so bad you can never be forgiven. You're right. You can never do anything to make yourself clean, but you can be forgiven. Come to him today. Come to Jesus in your filth, in your messiness, and you will hear the words, Be thou clean. And you'll be made clean. Isn't that good news? Let's have prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, the sacrifice that's been made in our behalf is something that we can't even comprehend. That holy being, Jesus, comes to this earth, God himself becoming a man. The repulsion you must have had at at sin and the filthiness and the wickedness on this earth, we cannot comprehend. Lord, oftentimes we find ourselves even embracing it, the thing, the very thing that repulses you. Lord, we recognize that we are repulsive to you, a holy being, but we thank you so much that we can come to you because you love us so much. If we'll reach out by faith and then we will, we will grasp you, that you have promised to cleanse us and make us clean. Lord, heaven is truly our home. And we are looking forward to being in the presence of holy beings. And I pray, Father, that not one of us will miss that assurance that we have. For you have promised if we will reach out by faith and touch you, you will make us clean, you'll make us right. Lord, we will be holy and ready for your kingdom. And I pray that every one of us by faith will do that very thing today. In Jesus' name.